Hello, Michael here from Small Robot Studio with another RenderMan 23 tutorial. Today we're going to be having a look at some of the different lights that you can use in RenderMan. I've got a little studio set up here for a car, as you can see. I've got this Porsche set up here, ready to be lit. I've already got a couple of lights in the scene, um, acting as the headlights. Um, and I don't believe I've put the tail lights on this one yet, but um, I have actually in a different version. So when we're talking about lights, there's a few different options. Up here on the Renderman shelf, you'll notice if you right click on the first light option, you'll get a rectangle light, light and a disc light. They uh, act exactly the same, except one's a square and one's a circle. So that's all you need about that. Um, so why don't we pop a disc light in and we'll move that up and rotate that over. Just holding J to snap that. Our common setup for studio lighting a car would be to have a large overhead diffuse light. So we'll pop that in like that. And then we'll bring up our IPR. So you'll see that we get this effect with the overhead light. We can go into its settings in the attribute editor and we can adjust a couple of different things here. So the first thing we might look at is the intensity and this is how um, bright it is essentially how much energy is being emitted so as you increase it you'll get a lot more light energy and as you do that you'll see that the uh, light is starting to be bounced more onto the floor um, and it's not being captured and diffused as much by the object that it's hitting exposure works as a multiplier now it starts at zero if I change it to one it's basically doubling the intensity um, it can be an easier way to work if you just wanted to, if so if you got to 100 and you didn't want to be working in crazy increments after that, you could just start doubling it with the exposure and keep going from there. So the next thing we can look at is the color. Um, this kind of acts like a diffuser when you're just working in um, values, so from white to black. You can obviously back it off. If you just wanted a softer light, for example, this could be a way of doing it. It does work in a very similar way to the intensity. Um, however, if you're looking at the light, um, which you can enable by clicking primary visibility, you'll see that the color actually changes when you change the color. So if you have a visible light and you want to change the color, that's the way, but it'll obviously also emit a color. So we can change that to red, for example and changing the saturation, we'll change the saturation, and then changing the value, we'll change the intensity. So you can do quite a lot of cool effects like with that. Color maps are useful for a number of reasons. You might want a more complex light source, um, or you might want your light source to be an image. So for example, so by loading a texture in here, um, it's loaded up the color texture that I've assigned to it. Um, which can be useful if you actually want your light to have the shape of the texture. Now, when I had the color set to red, it was overriding the RGB color of the texture, um, but with the, um, with the color turned to white, it will just uh, revert to its standard texture. And if you've seen the uh, full Porsche scene that I, uh, the full cyberpunk scene that I did with this, which is actually not 100% complete, um, you see I use this method quite a lot for just getting nice um, background lights and uh, you can either light link those um, to just affect certain things like for example I can light link it to the car and then that way it won't affect the background so say I've got exposure set to 20 you can see it's starting to flood the uh, background um, what I can do here is go to rendering and we'll go to lighting and shading and light centric and then our light is called pixel rectangular light and you can see that everything in the scene is selected so I can just go through and deselect everything and then just select the car and that way you see that you don't get any of the uh, light filtering in onto the surface like you did here I'm going to delete that light and create a new disk light for the rest of this example here. Uh, now in this particular scene my light has come up with a white uh, background and that's because I already have a light in the scene called disk light um, so I would have to rename that previous one. Um, because it's in a folder it does that automatically in Maya. It's not necessarily a bug it's just something it does and you'll see if you render it still acts the exact same as a standard light would. Now we can enable temperature here and this is the white 
um, temperature of the light, 6500 will basically return you a white result. Um, but if you go down to a lower number like 3500 and run the IPR, you'll notice the light starts to be tinged a warmer hue and the lower you go, the closer to red it will get. I normally use uh, temperature on most of my lights. Um, it's a little bit more interesting to have a slight temperature change rather than just 6500K, which is going to give you white. You could go to a small difference like 5500, it's just going to warm it up a slight amount and it will just make your light seem a little bit more natural. If we go down to the refine um, lobe, if we go down to the refine lobe, if you increase the emission focus, basically what it's doing is it's tightening up the area which is being um, lit. And if you normalize that, you'll find that the light is spread more consistently in the area of focus, similar to how a spotlight would work. But this is actually not a spotlight. We can use a spot, do spotlights differently than this. Um, and then the focus tint will just be the area that is in focus. We'll have a tint to it, like so. Specular amount is how much is going to be affected, uh, how much specular materials are going to be affected by your light. So if you remove this, this car is mostly specular, um, except for things like the tires. Um, but even the tires have a small amount of specularity on them. So you notice that the car is getting lit quite a bit differently now. Inversely, if we increase the specularity and decrease the fuse amount, you can't really see much of the ground anymore. So this can be useful for uh, controlling your lights quite a lot if you're trying to get a, um, a nice highlight rim on like something like a car. You can just have a lot of specular amount um, and not much defuse and then you can you don't have to light link all crazy to sorts of geometry. Um, you can just quickly switch it to that. Uh, the intensity near distance works with say for example without its head on. If I bring this light very close you'll see that light starts to burn um, at the top of the car. So if we increase the near distance, it'll start to soften that. So basically after a point, it's saying, okay, the light isn't going to be um, multiplied anymore by its, uh, by its proximity to whatever it's lighting. Cone angle is how we can do our spot lighting. So you can see in RenderMan now that it's getting these lines on the outside of it and that's showing where the spot is and then we can soften the outside of that with the cone softener. So you can get a nice spotlight effect like that. IES profiles are real life light profiles that you can um, put into your light and it will simulate an actual light. Um, these are open source, so you can actually grab them. Um, I think it's from the IES website. They're actually available on the RenderMan website, so you can just jump here, um, renderman.pixar.com slash IES-profiles will get you to this. And then you can sort of see some examples here of how they work, um, what the sort of shapes you're going to get out of them. So for example, why don't we grab the star-focused one, that looks kind of cool. And you can see as this renders up, you get some different varieties of intensity of your light, so it um, can just add some nice effects. Profile scale kind of works um, a little bit backwards to what you would expect. And if you go into the negatives, it will actually increase the scale or size of the IES light. Um, and then conversely, as you go into the positives, it will do the opposite. And then profile normalization will just normalize your values. Enable shadows, pretty straightforward. If you disable it, no shadows being cast by any of the objects that are being illuminated by your light. So if you had two lights in the scene, um, one light could be casting shadows and the other one wouldn't. Um, so for example, okay, so this is a bit weird to show, but what I've done is I've set up a light with shadows and you can see the shadows are being cast from the right hand side and the, the shadow is moving to the left, but you also see that the underside of the car is being lit by this overhead light that doesn't cast shadows. So now if we enable the shadows there, you'll see that there's a darker underside of the car. Max shadow distance set to negative one, it would mean infinite, and then any value other aside from that will give it an actual um, distance value. Um, shadow fall off will just fall off infinitely, obviously, as well, and then you can tighten that up, um, which we may be able to see here. Difficult to show in this render, but it will tighten up the shadow fall off. And then the shadow fall off gamma is the amount of gamma being applied to the fall off of your shadow. So decreasing it will give you darker results. 
Trace subsets are, you're mainly going to run into using trace sets when you're um, using subsurface scattering. If you've got two objects and they're colliding uh, and they're intersecting, if you want the light to pass through, say, one object and out the other side of it without seeing the light that's intersect it, intersecting it, then that's where you use a trace set. I'll cover that probably more in subsurface scattering though. Advanced is actually one of the other lobes where you will find yourself quite a bit. Um, one of the things I often will do would be normalize my light. So regardless of its size, if I set this to 20, regardless of its size, it's always going to be emitting the same value of light. And this becomes really useful when you're when you've got a lot of lights in the scene and you're trying to ba balance out your values. Um, having your light lights normalized will just allow you to work within a very similar um, framework of intensity for, across all of your lights. Tracing light paths is used for caustics, um, which I won't really have a, uh, go into here. It's, I think I've already got a caustics tutorial on um, 422, which I think would still work here. Uh, essentially, this is just going to allow this light to emit caustic photons. Thin shadows is used for faking um, refraction and caustics through a glass object. I won't really show it here. I, I'll, I'll try and cover that maybe in a refraction or a um, caustics tutorial, uh, but you can use it to sort of fake caustics and, it, and it's a, a lot um, less costly on your render times. Light samples um, will at zero use your um, sample rate set under your render settings. So at this point will be set to IPR 64 um, and my final render would be 256. Um, if you want to override the sample so you don't want to sample this light as many times you could set it lower or if you wanted to sample more times you could set it higher. And light groups uh, has to do with LPEs. That's something I've already covered in a separate tutorial. If you want to look at the LPE tutorial that I've already done. Importance multiplier will sort of balance the amount of samples that are being used between all of your light sources. At the default it's set to one and I would rarely change this to be honest. But if you wanted to have one particular light um, be sampled more, so if it's your key uh, light and you've only got a rim or something like that and you're not really too worried about the quality of that light because it seems to be working okay at lower sample rates, you might want to increase the importance. So that means you will sample more uh, rays from this light but less from all the other lights in the scene. So that pretty much covers the uh, standard area light which is the rectangle and disc light for RenderMan um, and the upcoming tutorials will have a look at some of the other lights and how you might use them and their settings as well. But a lot of these settings, um, the, a lot of the basic settings are the same across all of them. So you'll find that once you know the um, standard lights, you'll be able to apply that knowledge to the other lights that are available. That's it for this tutorial. If you found it useful, make sure you leave a like so other people can find it. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe as we're bringing out CG and illustration tutorials every week, just like this one. Become a patron and access tutorial assets, bonus content, a private discord, and more by clicking the link below.